Welcome to the ATA Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Baird, and you're listening to Inside Specialization, our series on the what, why, and how of specializing in a specific field of translation or interpreting. In each episode, members of ATA's Professional Development Committee will interview translation and interpreting specialists. They'll ask about what the work entails, what skills are needed, the pros and cons, and so much more. The goal is to showcase the variety of career paths in translation and interpreting and help working professionals and students understand what's out there, how they can get started, and what they need to succeed. Specialization is arguably the best way to strengthen your translation and interpreting business and stand out from the crowd. We're hoping to bring you one episode a month, and we hope you'll join us on this informative journey. This podcast is brought to you by the American Translators Association. If you'd like to know more about ATA, we'll have some information at the end of the show. All right, now over to the PD Committee and this edition of Inside Specialization. Hi, and welcome to Inside Specialization, a special feature of the ATA podcast on specialization and diversification. My name is Daniel Shevesta, and I am the Assistant Administrator of ATA's Language Technology Division. And for this episode of our Inside Specialization podcast, I am interviewing Arlo Lomel uh, today. Arlo Lomel is a senior analyst with the independent market analysis firm CSA Research, where he focuses on language technology and translation quality. A noted writer and speaker on localization and translation, he had its standards development at the Localization Industry uh, Standards Association, LISA, and later at the Globalization and Localization Association in Gala, before working on translation quality topics at the German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence, DFKI. He has a PhD from Indiana University and currently resides in Bloomington, Indiana. Arl, it's an immense pleasure for AT to have you talk to our audience about MT, machine translation and MTPE, machine translation post-editing, something that's on the minds of many professional translators nowadays, and also on the minds of many aspiring linguists who are just now joining the profession. They may be asking themselves, is MTPE or MT what I signed up for when I chose a language career? So thanks again for being here today. And let me start with my very first question. I know you have a background in linguistics, comparative literature, and a PhD in folkloristics. Can you tell our listeners how you got from that to topics such as machine translation, artificial intelligence, or augmented translation, a term that you helped coin some time ago? Yeah, so I started out as a student in linguistics. And when I was an undergraduate, I was doing all of the graduate level coursework because that's where I thought the interesting stuff was. So, um, you know, I did the introductory coursework I had to do, but for all the electives in my university study, I was doing the, the 600, five and 600 level courses. And then that put me in a bit of a bind because when I went to go on and do uh, a master's, I would have had to repeat all of this coursework that I'd already done. And that didn't really sound like something I wanted to do. So I initially started in comparative literature, uh, where I think the connection to languages is, is obvious. Uh, I did that for a while, enjoyed it, learned a lot. But at the end, I felt like I'm just learning to talk about literature the way a lit crit person does. And I wanted to do something that was more focused on people and culture. So I looked around and said, folklore studies. That sounds interesting. And so I went ahead and did that. And Interestingly enough, for those who don't know the history, um, linguistics and folklore were considered the same field up through the 1950s. So it isn't as far a field as one might think. I did my PhD in this field, but the whole time I was working for Lisa on things around language, translation, localization, and all this. So when I finished my PhD, I was approached by the German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence to basically continue work I'd been doing alongside my studies the whole time, uh, work on building frameworks for assessing translation quality. And um, they were interested specifically in how to bring machine translation and human translation onto equal footing, 
And so that was my entry into really working closely with machine translation. Uh, so it was both a side to side thing and uh, a natural evolution of what I was already doing. Thank you, Arl. That's a fascinating personal story. Now, going back to the concept of augmented translation, how is post editing nowadays different from what one might call classic post editing of some time ago? Okay, so you know this is an important distinction to make. Uh, when we talk about post editing in its classic form, this was the idea that you have a text, you run it through uh, a machine translation system, and then you give that text as a whole to a post editor who goes through and usually has recourse to the source text and is tasked with fixing the problems and bringing it up to a uh, some standard that is more or less what a human translator would have done. Uh, there's some variation, you know, there's full post editing, which is supposed to be all the way to what a human translator would have done. There's light post editing where it's uh, the editing's done to improve uh, accuracy, but not necessarily fluency unless it gets in the way. So you end up with something that sounds a bit stilted, but is still readable. Um, the difference we see today is that technology has really moved on and most translators and post editors are working in integrated environments. Um, think CAT tools, computer assisted translation tools, or as some people call them, translation environment tools. And in this view, rather than fixing a text that's been translated, um, the translation starts showing up as an alternate resource alongside translation memory and other things. And so it's a much more interactive mode in which the translator is simply working as though machine translation were just like translation memory. Uh, if we go a bit further to the idea of augmented translation, it's much more uh, translator centric in that we now have the machine translation adapting on the fly to improve and respond to the linguist feedback. Um, there's a couple products that do this. Uh, one is Lilt. Um, there's Modern MT from Translated uh, and, and a few others out there. So certainly don't take any of those as endorsements. Um, but then you also have improved terminology management. You have tools to help root jobs to the right linguists. All of this designed to remove administrative and non-productive work away from the linguist and provide that individual at the center with the best resources to facilitate his or her work. Um, so for example, in an augmented translation paradigm, if there's a reference to um, a law and the translator needs to know the official translation of the title of that law, that would be automatically provided rather than making the translator stop, fire up Google and say, okay, what should I be calling this law? Which is what happens if you don't have these resources. So it's all about making the translator more productive and allowing them to focus on the things that require their intelligence while automating away all of the repetitive, mind-numbing sorts of work that they might otherwise face. That sounds like the perfect world for the linguists. Now, how do the different MT technologies, the different types of MT engines that are currently available on the market, affect the work of post editors in different ways on the way to uh, the perfect world of augmented translation where everything that's uh, unproductive gets served to the translator? Uh, this is a very interesting question because um, we've seen MT in the past 20 years make, I think, undisputed uh, improvements to the point where the tech press, with I think a good deal of hype, actually starts claiming it's as good as human translators. Uh, I don't buy that for a moment. But when we look at how the technology has changed, we had for many years rule-based machine translation. Uh, which involves laboriously hand coding rules and putting in dictionaries and applying them. And uh, this technology was often made fun of because it, it often sounded very stilted. Uh, it couldn't handle things it hadn't seen before, uh, but was still useful for post-editing tasks. 
Then along came um, statistical machine translation, which has really been around for um, about 20 years, a little more than 20 years now, um, and really took off with the first incarnation of Google Translate. And suddenly you had this technology that could be trained on uh, translation memory data, and the time to build an engine went from years to weeks. And so we saw machine translation being used much more widely. Um, it gave better output by many measures than the uh, old school rule-based systems. And so post editors preferred to use it. Now, this particular incarnation had the advantage that when it was wrong, it was usually obviously wrong. And so it was easy to spot what needed to be repaired. Then starting in 2015, um, we had uh, neural machine translation come along. And I'll just mention in 2015, when I was at DFKI, one of my last discussions in November of that year was, when do you think we're going to see neural MT? And internally, we all said, oh, maybe four or five years. I left. And by the end of that same month, the first systems were being launched. And it just exploded. And within about six months, work had ceased on statistical MT, and it all moved to neural. And the reason was, is that it just read so much better. You had stuff that sounded like it was written by a human in many cases. Not always, but everybody agreed, this is better than that statistical stuff. Um, it took a while, though, to realize that this was a double-edged sword for the human linguists working with it. And that's because it sounded so good that it became harder to spot problems and fix them. Um, and so in my work at CSA Research, we've actually had some companies talk to us about going all the way back to rule-based systems because they were easier to edit. Uh, despite you know these occasional companies moving back to older technology, I think you know it's clear neural MT is here to stay. This is where all the work's being done. But we need to be aware when we're integrating it that it isn't all sunshine and butterflies, that the advantages come with some drawbacks for the human translator. And so then you need training and how to recognize the errors. You need a higher degree of vigilance uh, and attention, perhaps, than you needed with older types. Very interesting insights. I have the same experience with neural MT. It was a major leap forward in my language pairs. But like you're saying, vigilance is still needed because the possible errors are becoming more subtle and easier to miss. Uh, moving forward, could you talk about the role of artificial intelligence, AI, more broadly in the translation and localization industry. What other use cases do you see there? What other career opportunities do you see there for the tech-enabled digital native kind of linguists uh, in the 2020s and beyond? Okay, there's um, two ways of, of looking at this. Uh, I'm gonna start with how I think that AI will be applied to the work that translators do. Uh, one of the biggest areas we're seeing right now is the application of machine learning technology to tasks around project management and vendor management. Um, we've seen increasing development of what we call lights out project management, which you can think of, uh, think of the tasks that uh, project managers typically do where they're assigning linguists to jobs. And then think of a system that has observed the content that is rooted to different linguists, has looked at quality scores, um, speed, um, other factors, and can now start automating that by saying, when you assign a new project, it looks at the actual content and says, okay, for this one, Jürgen's gonna be best for that content, but for this other piece, Jochen's gonna be uh, the best for it, and automatically sends that content to linguists knowing their availability uh, and their skill set so that they're getting the content where they're best suited. Um, so that's one area where we see AI making real uh, inroads uh, that could be and should be beneficial for linguists because they're going to be getting the stuff where they have skills. It will allow greater specialization. 
uh, and greater attention to uh, the factors that lead to project success. Um, we're also seeing uh, artificial intelligence being applied to tasks such as uh, cleaning up translation memories uh, to avoid bad translation memory segments that poison projects. Um, there's the development of, and I think this is a crucial one, the development of uh, quality estimation technology, which allows a machine to watch the output of human translators or machine translation and flag potential problems for attention early on. Um, does this by comparing the, the new text to a database of known good translations for a given client, given project, whatever it may be. And so it's able to start identifying problems or flag things that reviewers need to pay attention to. Um, when applied to MT, it's particularly useful in that it could flag um, bad MT or to use a metaphor, uh, for movies, I like to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly of machine translation, where you have good MT that probably doesn't need someone to look at it. Uh, you have bad MT that can be made good, and then you have ugly MT that just should be thrown out, and the translator worked from scratch. And so you can apply AI to start identifying uh, these content, at least probabilistically, and help the translator focus on what they need to do rather than verifying stuff that didn't really need their attention in the first place. So those are sort of inward looking things the industry has going on. And then if we look uh, outward at new tasks, we're going to see um, translators of the future uh, doing new tasks like building multilingual data sets, um, creating multilingual data sets, uh, we've already seen some LSPs move in this direction, and Lionbridge uh, very profitably sold off a division that that did this um, a little over a year ago, where companies will come and they'll say, I need um, 20,000 examples of how to ask what the weather is in Swahili. And having translators, um, linguists, um, any individual who who has those language skills to start generating this data is adding value to external things. Um, similarly, uh, AI, as it enables new kinds of jobs, could allow um, translators to start being involved more closely with specific clients to do things like uh, escort interpreting or specialize in the content of particular clients. So they start taking on kind of a concierge role uh, so we're going to see a lot more opportunity for specialization and the emergence of new tasks, uh, probably ones I haven't even thought of, that AI is going to enable. That's fascinating. Many uh, upcoming opportunities for those that are willing or looking to adapt to the new realities of technology. Now, as someone who regularly presents on pricing in our industry, there's something I'm really interested in, and that is your take on the pricing of MTP or uh, augmented translation in this environment where uh, a lot of things are automated away. Uh, where do you see MTP going in the context of broader pricing trends? Is it a race to the bottom as some people like to picture it? Or can there truly be lucrative opportunities if we look at the value created with technology, the lower cost of providing these services through the lens of our fragmented and highly competitive market? Yeah, I think one way of looking at this is through the lens of sort of basic theory of capitalism. Of course, it's always a uh, a race to the bottom, at least from the perspective of what the buyer wants. They always want more for less. Uh, from the perspective of the provider, it should always be, let's try and maximize what we're getting from this. And that there's a tension between these two things that, that finds uh, what you might consider an optimal price point. Now, I know that somebody says, well, I should really be making $200 an hour We'll say, well, it's not the optimal price point, but but this is how prices are found. It's um, in economic terms, it's what's called a discovery function. 
Now, where this starts applying to MT post-editing is as you lower the cost of production, you would expect the cost of the service to go down as well. So let's just assume that we're working in an augmented translation environment and that it enables translators to be three times as productive. Um, if we're looking at per word rates, if they're three times as productive, they could slash their prices, cut them into 50%, and at the end of the day, they'd be making more money than they would otherwise. So the technology as it develops should be bringing prices down, but it should be bringing up the effective net income for linguists. It should be raising it. And that's that would be the ideal situation. Um, whether we actually arrive at that depends on a lot of factors. Um, but I'm cautiously optimistic this is what will happen because when you lower the cost of something, the demand for it rises. So we should see if the cost of translation comes down, overall demand will rise. And by automating away the stuff that's relatively low value, that leaves the human to focus on the high value stuff where they should be getting paid more. So my prediction is over time, we're going to see a concentration of the human element in the high margin, high value side of the equation, while the low value, low margin side will be increasingly dominated by unedited MT or very lightly edited MT. And here we need the quality estimation and other things to differentiate this. So it's my hope, uh, my prediction that we're going to start seeing an increase in income for translators over time. Of course, there's a lot of things going on. It's going to take time to get there, but we're set up as many other industries have been that when something comes along and really eviscerates what they've been doing, the industries reinvent themselves in a way that increases their value. You think of stockbrokers who've now become wealth managers. You think of accountants who used to be bookkeepers, all that got automated away by uh, Excel and QuickBooks. And now you have specialist forensic accountants or uh, uh, accountants who specialize in planning for the future or accountants who specialize in fraud detection. All these things, they're making more money than ever before. There's more accountants than there ever were before, all because most of their work was taken away. And I hope that's where translators end up. Very interesting. Thank you for that hopeful perspective. Now, looking at the present, many translators are now facing requests from translation buyers who have heard great things about machine translation, possibly some of that hype. Uh, and many linguists find themselves in a position where they have to explain to their clients, educate their clients about the opportunities of machine translation, but also its limitations and risks. Could you give us your take on the role of the different translation types, namely raw machine translation, post-edited machine translation, and perhaps 100% human translation in business context? Um, I like to think of this in terms of risk management. Uh, this is a useful way to think about it. I'm going to use um, an analogy that comes from uh, Jeff Kobe, a uh, longtime ATA uh, member, that if somebody gives you a jar of cookies, or if you're in Europe, biscuits, as you may call them, and tells you, yeah, there's um, a cookie in this, in this one that's poisoned, you can't detect it externally, uh, and if you eat that cookie, it'll kill you question is, would you eat from that jar of cookies? And I think the question is pretty transparently no. Uh, you wouldn't. And for many scenarios, use of unedited MT is like this because it can contain something that's just horrendously wrong and could lead to death or injury. So if you were translating medical records uh, or financial filings with regulatory bodies, no way in heck would you trust unedited MT because if there's a poison cookie in there, you're dead. Now, on the flip side, if we say, yeah, there may be a poison cookie in this jar, it's a one in one million chance. And if you get it, you're just going to have a slightly upset stomach for a day. 
would you eat those cookies? And I think, yeah, most of us would say, yeah, I, I, I can tolerate that risk. And that's a situation, if you were in an analogous situation where you would say, I'm going to use unedited MT. Um, there's lots of cases, you know, if somebody can ask questions or if there's no risk of anyone being harmed, or you just need to know, is this content relevant to me? Then unedited MT is your friend. Uh, in a lot of um, corporate environments, we see it being used for things like e-discovery, uh, for triaging social media posts, uh, for working with user-generated content of uncertain value, but where the company itself didn't create it. So if there's a bad translation, it's low risk. So that's you know a great, great use case for unedited MT. Then in the middle, you get something where Again, to use the poison cookie analogy, you'd say, well, there may be a cookie there. It could be harmful. Uh, but you know what? You can kind of spot those cookies if you know what to look for. And that would be analogous to where you'd say we're going to use uh, uh, some sort of post editing thing because you have someone who can go along, spot the poison cookies, take them out, replace them with good cookies, and you're good to go. And where the risk, if one slips through, isn't going to be a, a huge problem. And so that that would be you know situations like you need to translate, say a court uh, decision. You're just using it internally to help plan a legal strategy, and it doesn't need to be the absolute perfect translation. Post editing could be a good way to get there. So thinking of it in risk, I think helps you see where all of these things apply. That's a great analogy, and I also like the perspective based on risk. I would like to go back one more time to how you made this connection between uh, your background in literature and linguistics and uh, folkloristics and being an advocate for AI and MT in our industry. Do you think MTP or uh, whatever we might call the new way of working going forward do you think it can offer a truly rewarding and fulfilling career for somebody who came to this profession with a love for languages? Is there a way, in your opinion, to be equally or similarly passionate about words and algorithms at the same time? Yeah, of course, it's not going to be for everybody. There are some people who say, I don't want to touch computer stuff. I'm not interested. And I think there will be a place for them. You know, I, I, if I were in that situation, I'd be looking at doing specialization in some industry um, where there's high risk profile. So MT isn't going to as easily make inroads. I'd say they're going to find a place or uh, in tasks like transcreation that I don't see any way uh, machine translation is going to replace humans in. Then you get the people who say, you know what? I like working with computers. I like working with language. This stuff's neat. Uh, and some of them will just run with it. They'll be perfectly happy. Then you get people in the middle who say, well, you know, I came into this because I like language. I worry that MT is going to take away what makes this human. And to them, I'd say, well, you know, repeatedly translating stuff you've seen hundreds of times before that could be automated, that's not really probably very rewarding. So you should be glad that the machine is taking that away and leaving you with the interesting things like coming up with terms for new concepts or translating stuff that really requires thought uh, that allows you to exercise your skill on something more com complicated than, uh, you know, click next to move to the uh, next screen or, uh, you know, um, click cancel to to quit the process or you know these things that we we see in, in hundreds and hundreds of variations so technology actually can enable you to do more rewarding things if you know how to work with it and if you allow it to do so very true finally uh how can linguists that are interested in mt best keep up to date with the rapid developments in this space. I guess this podcast episode will be a great place to start, but can you recommend any additional resources that people can follow? Uh, I mean, 
I, in a sense, I'd say come to, to CSA research, um, our blogs. We cover a lot of this. Now, some of it, of course, is going to be not really aimed at the individual translator uh, because we sell to corporations, but we put a lot of stuff out for free. You can look at our website. Um, there are other news sources that cover it. Um, I'd say look at the MT providers as well and follow what they're doing. A lot of them have blogs, have webinars. Uh, if you want to learn about MT, there's never been a better time because so much of what used to be seen as proprietary and kept in-house is now published open source. So if you're really tech-minded, go and read all the, the papers published by Google and DeepL and Microsoft and others. Um, if you're not, again, look at blogs um, and other things. And I'd say with it, of course, be curious, be open. But I would put one word of caution in, uh, ignore the mainstream tech press. Most of the people who cover MT there don't really get it. And so they're prone to uh, hyperbole and things where you really should take it with a grain of salt. So look more to specialists who really understand it. Thank you. Arl, I know you have a lot more to say about language, technology, machine translation, etc. But we'll have to leave it there for today. Thank you so much for taking the time to share your experience and expertise with our ATA audience. Thank you. You've been listening to Inside Specialization, our series on the what, why, and how of specializing in a specific field of translation or interpreting. Big thanks to everyone involved in the production of this episode. ATA's PD committee developed and coordinated the interview. Mixing and editing was done by Derek Platts. Mary David and Rashan Pacarell at ATA headquarters provided editorial and technical support. Now, if you learned anything new in today's podcast, I bet there's somebody out there who would like to know it too. Don't be stingy. Tell them about us. I've gotten to know so many great podcasts that way. I promise they'll thank you for it. And if you're not an ATA member, listen up. I've been a member for over 20 years. I can honestly say that ATA launched my freelance career and I've never looked back. Nowadays, the demand for translators and interpreters is at an all-time high, but finding quality work isn't easy. ATA membership can make a difference. And ATA isn't just for translators or interpreters. Individuals, companies, and organizations can become members. We have teachers, professors, hospital administrators, language company owners, technology developers, as well as language companies, universities, hospitals, and government agencies. Go to ATA's website, atanet.org, for details. Or check out past episodes of this podcast where we talk about the benefits of membership and what's currently happening in the association. Thanks again for listening, everyone. Talk to you again soon.